Hi, welcome to Ask Me Anything. I'm Rebecca Atkins. I'm Associate Professor of Music Education at the Hugh Hodgson School of Music. I'm excited to be here today with two of our music faculty members. Um, we're going to, the Hugh Hodgson School of Music has performance degrees, theory composition degrees, music therapy degrees, music education degrees, um, and a host of other related music degrees here and we have over 500 students. We have performances all the time and we're just super active on the university campus. Today I'd like to introduce Ellen Ritchie. She's an instructor and the cl clinical coordinator for the music therapy program here at UGA. She holds her master's degree in music and music therapy from Southern Methodist University and she received her doctor of musical arts degree from the University of Georgia. Um, she's a great singer. I've enjoyed singing with her. She's a member of the American Music Therapy Association and is certified by the Certification Board for Music Therapists and is a licensed music therapist here in the state of Georgia. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ellen Ritchie. Hello, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm really happy to be here and um, we will get started. And I am going to share my screen and Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go. Um, talking about music therapy today in the COVID-19 era, um, caring for others, caring for ourselves. And I wanna to touch on both of those things today. Um, because I so often get asked, what is music therapy? Um, I wanna begin with a brief discussion of a definition of music therapy. And this is as defined by the American Music Therapy Association, which is our professional association. And there we go. Um, music therapy defined. Music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. Um, it's, it's kind of a wordy definition. It's a little bit awkward, but the main points are what we do as music therapists is supported by research. Um, it is central, music is central to those interventions. It's a musical means of providing therapy. Um, we do address specific goals, which we determine through a process of assessment and evaluation. And we are accredited with both a national certification and a state licensure here in the state of Georgia. So that's what, music therapy is. Um, some of those goals that we address include promoting wellness, managing stress, alleviating pain, expressing feelings, enhancing memory, improving communication, and promoting physical rehabilitation. And a lot of those are goal areas that um, are really important these days. Music therapy can be utilized in just about any healthcare setting with people of all ages. And here are some of the places where we work. Um, medical and psychiatric hospitals, rehab facilities, agencies both residential and community-based that serve people with developmental disabilities, senior centers, nursing homes, hospice programs, schools, and a number, more and more music therapists are in private practice, which allows them to work both with individuals and groups within a community setting. And all of these settings have been severely impacted by the pandemic, whether we're dealing with treating patients with the virus or protecting our patients, our clients, and ourselves from the virus. And in many cases, this has limited the, the ability of music therapists to access clients and to continue to provide services, especially in those first days of lockdown we were very often locked out of the places, the very places where we were needed to provide services for our, for our clients. And music therapy education was also greatly affected. That, that's how I was affected through this. Um, as practicum and internship experiences were suddenly disrupted or in most cases stopped entirely. It was just, we were cut off from all of our training and all of our great plans that we had to continue the semester for our clinical, clinical education. Our professional association acted very quickly to provide support and resources. They established a resource page on our website 
that provides information to professional therapists, facilities, educators, and students. And this site is being continually updated and expanded. We get probably a weekly email from AMTA with, with what's been added to that as, as we learn more about, about the virus, as the research continues and the conditions, we, we learn more and more about it. And so they're really keeping us informed of those things as it impacts our work as therapists and as educators. Um, we've had a lot of online meetings and presentations with and for educators as we're all exploring how to continue our clinical training, which is so important to the education of a music therapist, that contact with people, um, being able to continue that when we may have little or no contact with our clients. In addition, AMTA established a COVID-19 task force whose members provide experience and expertise in trauma-informed care, disaster response, healthcare administration, music therapy education, and music therapy in private practice. So we've had really a lot of support from our association as everybody in the whole country is dealing with this situation and how can we still be music therapists? How can we still reach our clients? How can we educate our students in the midst of this, of this crisis? So in a few months, we've gone from this, music therapy, people close together, making music, sharing music, to this virtual music therapy services, um, music therapy by Zoom, music therapy in the window. Um, we, are, we always say, and I always tell my students, music therapists are flexible and adaptable. And that has really been the case in this situation. We're not sitting back and saying, well, too bad, we can't go, we can't see our clients, but finding ways to, to continue to work with our clients. Um, exploring ways to deliver services in a safe way to meet the ongoing and the new needs of the clients and the patients that we work with. So we're, we're stepping up to the challenge. There have been webinars, presentations, educational experiences, trying to get people up to speed and teaching us how to navigate this new reality that we're, that we're all dealing with. Um, but music and its healing qualities are not limited to music therapists or healthcare settings or professional treatment. Um, during the first few weeks into the lockdown, the internet was lit up with virtual musical events of all kinds, from the expertly produced ensembles of professional musicians playing in their respective homes to the family parody of Les Mis. And if you haven't seen that, I really recommend that you look it up because it's hilarious. Um, people were using music to channel and express their emotions in a very serious way, in a very funny way. And one of the most moving musical experiences came from the senior class of the Hugh Hodson School of Music. Last May, all on their own, they created a beautiful expression of hope, pride, and UGA spirit. And I want to take a few minutes to share it with you here. If you haven't seen it, you really need to. And if you have seen it, it's, it's worth seeing again. So let's hope that this works.
The first time I saw that video, I literally sat at my desk and sobbed. Um, and it still gives me goosebumps. And if we have loyal Bulldog alumni out there, if you're crying, it's okay. I've done that too. Um, anyway, through this and similar efforts, people are using music to channel their feelings, their emotions in a unique and powerful way. This is an expressive side to that coping process because sometimes music does speak louder than words. Um, but there's also a receptive side to using music as a way to cope. Using, using music as a tool for self-care is not a new concept. It's just that we don't often think of it that way, unless we're music therapists. Um, who has not been touched and inspired by hearing just the right song at just the right moment? The emotional possibilities are endless. A sad breakup song, angry blues, energizing rock, a song or a hymn that speaks to our spirit and our beliefs. Very often these experiences happen by chance. You hear the song on the radio and you go, wow, that song really speaks to me, that touched me. Um, but we can be intentional in how we choose music. And when we do that, we are our own experts. I have a colleague in music therapy named Amy Kunimura, who way before the pandemic hit, founded a self-care institute that provides support and resources to professionals, including music therapists, because sometimes we need to be reminded to take care of ourselves. And I like the way that she describes this process of using music for self-care. Music can be a friend to lean on right now. Music might also be your coworker, an emotional outlet, a voice of reason, a way to connect with others, a reminder that you're not alone, a way to keep your kids occupied. All of these things make our relationship with music very important. And I think of that as, as being intentional with, with how we use music. And she describes two simple ways to use music with intentionality. First of all, music can help create structure in your day. Choosing music for different times of the day can 
can kind of help provide a structure that especially in these days of of working from home and remote working can be can be very difficult. What do you need to wake up in the morning? Do you want something energetic or something calm to ease you into the day? When do you need energy? When do you need calming and peaceful sounds? There are all sorts of playlists out there. If you go to Spotify, you can find a playlist for virtually everything that there is. Um, and those can be great, but don't hesitate to create your own based on the music that speaks to you in a unique way. Another way that music can help is to be just familiar and grounding. Um, music can immediately elicit positive memories and associations. It can sometimes bring sad or painful thoughts. So pay attention to how the music that you're listening to, the music that you choose, how that makes you feel. You might find a new song that speaks to where you are and what you need right now. And that might change. It might be different from day to day. Again, be intentional. And when you happen to hear a song that resonates with you, don't let it go by. Find some way to remember it so you can find it again when you need it. We tend to treat music as background noise and very often it is, um, but it can be so much more than that. So as music therapists, as people, um, we're doing the best we can to live our lives, to do our jobs, to take care of those we love, to take care of ourselves, and music is one tool that's available to everyone. It can bring comfort and hope. It can be motivating. It can be consoling. So I would say tune into the music around you. Surround yourself with music that speaks to however and wherever you are in this moment. And sometimes the music that speaks to you might just be silence. Give yourself permission to just turn everything off and take a moment of quiet. Um, I want to leave you with one more memorable musical response that spoke to me a few months ago. Um, and there are days when this, when this speaks to me still. Hey, so as some of you guys might know, I'm a music teacher and I found that one of the best ways that I can process the whole transition to online learning and teaching is to write a song. So I wrote a song. I'd like to share that with you guys now. Here we go. <laughs> months ago that that's exactly where I was um, and some days that's that's where I am again um, anyway that's just my little funny thing to share because music can do that too it can make you laugh it can make you cry um, it does all of those things so if you want more information about music therapy our professional association website is very easy to remember musictherapy.org um, thank you for listening and go dogs. And now I would love to hear your thoughts and your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie. Um, I have a question for you. I actually related a lot to that as well as a music educator. Um, as I've been working with my students on writing research and reading research, a lot of them have chosen music therapy topics. So I had a student look up a lot of research, clinical research about how music um, was, how effective it, it was with people with PTSD and managing their emotions and that. Um, can you just talk about a couple of different areas? I mean, there's so many areas of research um, in music therapy, but just some that interest you and, and you'd like to share with us. Sure. Um, one, there's a, a really interesting project that um, an organization, well, they're, they're based in Atlanta, Alchemy Sky Music. Um, he works with, um, with veterans and, and they've been doing some projects with some, some other music therapists of having songwriting workshops. So you bring in a group of, of clients, of, of veterans who may be suffering from PTSD or, or whatever, um, and then a group of professionals and you pair each client with, with a therapist and they work with that person to create a song that expresses whatever it is that they need to get out. Um, because hearing, speaking your words and sharing your emotions and then hearing them sung, hearing them performed can be a very powerful um, and moving way of, of experiencing music, of, of coming out. Um, they do a lot of stuff also with um, performances, having, having the, 
the, the clients form bands and create songs and perform music. And that can be very empowering, learning a new, a new ability, a new skill, and finding that you can use that new skill to express who you are and maybe explore a little bit more about who you are. Thanks. I uh, also want to bring into the conversation our newest faculty member in music therapy, Ellen Hamm. Um, we are so excited to have her here. The music therapy program, as you may know, has gotten a lot of national attention. We're number one on some different polls in the country, and um, we are working on building a master's program here, hopefully to start um, next year is our hope. And uh, we've brought in Ellen Hamm, and she is um, before coming here, she's been at uh, Florida State University uh, working on her degree in music therapy. She was the research coordinator in early neurodevelopment and neurorehabilitation lab in the Research Institute of Nationwide Children's Hospital, as well as a music therapist in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, she's taught as faculty at Belmont University, and she specializes um, in the pacifier activated lullaby, which is called PAL, as we know it. And we're excited to have her here to join us as well. So I want to bring in um, Ellen Ham to the conversation. And um, Ellen, your side of this is the medical side a lot, and we're so excited that you're here. Can you talk about how um, telehealth has changed music therapy um, sessions and how you see some of this being used in the future when we get back to normal? Thank you for uh, asking me to join you guys today. And thanks for that great question, Rebecca. Um, I was in the hospital when they uh, COVID first hit. And so the first thing that was pulled was all of these additional services. We were asked to leave the hospital at first, which we totally understood. Um, but one of the things that happened is they quickly realized how much they missed music therapy because of its um, ability to not only help the patients through this, which the patients at this point were not allowed any visitors. So they had no additional people coming in to see them besides their nurses and the doctors um, for good safety reasons, of course. Um, but then also the staff missed seeing us as well because we were not only helping the clients, we were also helping the nurses and the doctors who were in a very stressful situation. So they quickly tried to figure out ways for us to come back. And the quickest way for us to come back was through telehealth, which was something new to a lot of us. Um, but we quickly learned that it was something that could be used for music therapy. And I think what it's allowed us to do is actually see more patients than we would have seen previously. One of the things that I did um, was help with an outreach program. So patients that had left the hospital that we wanted to follow up with. And previously we had had a radius that we could only serve people that lived within a certain mile radius from the hospital. But because of telemedicine, we were able to see patients that lived further away from us. And we were surrounded by several rural communities that we were able to serve that we wouldn't have been able to serve if we had not moved to telehealth. So I think that's one way that telehealth has helped to increase music therapy services to people who we would love to provide services to. And I'm hopeful that that will stay past the COVID pandemic. Um, something that we've had to think through is how you do music in Zoom with delays um, in most of these telehealth uh, portals are great for talking one on one with a doctor or a nurse, but maybe not conducive for music. And so there's a delay. So figuring how, out how to do that. And normally when we come for a music therapy session, we come with lots of instruments that we want you to play and engage in active music making. But if we are not there bringing you all the instruments, we have to figure out what you have and how we can use what you already have available to you. So that's made us be very creative as music therapists, figuring out how we're going to provide the services that we're used to providing. Thank you. Um, have either of you noticed among your students and your clients and other UGA students' clients a shift in the needs or additional interventions over the last five to six months? Um, actually, over the last five to six months, we haven't had contact with our usual client groups. Um, we finished the spring semester totally shut down. The students all went home. Um, the Students in the schools, we do a lot of practicum experiences in our local school system. They were all online. Um, the hospital that we go to was, was closed to visitors. The, the nursing homes, assisted living, they didn't want. Um, 
And, and so it, we're just now beginning to explore ways that we can get back in touch with our clients. Um, and I reached out just this week to our different community partners, um, just asking if, um, if they would be interested in some, some virtual music therapy sessions of, of some kind that my students might, might be able to provide. And I got a, a number of really super positive responses. Um, several of the teachers who are our, our local district is starting online, but they'll be Zooming with their kids and they'll be providing content. And they would be very interested in getting our students involved as well as um, we work with an agency through Advantage Behavioral Health Systems. Um, they have a substance abuse program for, um, for clients with drug and alcohol addictions. Typically, that's one of the groups that comes to campus for music therapy. But again, the School of Music is restricting outside people and the agency is, they're not bringing their clients out on community trips like they usually do, but they're very interested in also having some, some virtual sessions with our students. So I, I feel like, especially having been, it was cut so short, there was no closure and having just months of, of no music therapy and now it's time when typically they would have music again, um, I really feel like they've, they've missed it. And, and that they are really eager for us to get our students involved in some way. Um, it's, it's a challenge. It's a little more, um, well, it's, I mean, it's new for me. It's new for my students. And it's a, little, it's a little bit more involved, I guess, than if you already had an established relationship with your clients and then you can kind of switch to that, to that online method. But, but there are certainly some, some good possibilities and a number of people in the community uh, that we typically serve are eager to to continue that association, which is great. Ellen, do you have anything to add to that? I think one thing is that a lot of our clients, um, especially in the hospital, they are sitting in the hospital with no uh, visitors. Um, and so besides us, they don't get a lot of interaction every day. So I think you do have some more of those mental health issues creeping in um, of depression and anxiety because they're in a very already stress inducing environment of the hospital. But with the ad, uh, with the addition of COVID, it can make it even more stressful. Um, and so talking with them through that and helping them figure out ways to fill their day. I'm not used to helping patients figure out how to fill the rest of their day. Um, and so that's been something new because they've got more they've got more time on their hands. Um, and through the outreach program that I did, it was mostly um, parents with infants who had just been recently discharged from the neonatal intensive care unit and helping them with their transition to home. And so again, some of these kids um, these parents are now home with their kids all the time. So again, it wasn't just what are we going to do during our music therapy session, but what are we going to do with them after we're done with our music therapy session? What are things that we can do outside of our time together and coming up with more creative activities for all of our families to do at home? Um, so coming up with some of homework, I guess you could call it, um, and different things like Dr. Ritchie was already talking about, about coming up with playlists and things like that that we could do so they could have music therapy resources besides just the session with me or with their other therapist. How have your music therapy students that were working um, through their internships uh, when COVID started, um, that were already out and were probably still considered essential personnel because it was such a service that they were doing. How did they kind of adapt to that and work through those um, and overcome some of those challenges? Um, I have to shout the praises of our internship directors. We had, um, we had a student who was finishing, she had about a month left of internship in, with Fulton County Schools. And so in her case, because the school had all gone, had all gone online, she was able to finish out. Um, I don't know how much contact she actually had with students in that last period, because I think they were still trying to figure out how they're going to, how they're going to navigate and finish their school year. Um, another student who was doing a, a, an internship with a private practice in the metro Atlanta area, they, as they shifted to that telehealth virtual model, they just, they brought the intern along with them. And so she was able, it, it took a little bit longer for her to complete the, the hours that she needed to get, but she's finished up this month and is, you know, has, has been able to do that. Um, as far as students, and I think those were the only two that were actually 
that were already towards the end of their internships. We've had students that are anticipating beginning internships again. And um, again, nothing's been, nothing's been canceled yet, which I'm very grateful for. I was just like waiting for those phone calls or those emails. Um, in most instances, uh, the, the, the internship has been delayed. Um, the student who was supposed to, to start with a private practice, that's, that's kind of been the most disrupted. They've asked that we just wait until February when they see how, how things are going, um, just because their practice is, is suffering now because they're just not able to see the clients that they, that they typically see. Um, my student, I have another student who's gonna be going back to Fulton County. Um, they delayed her start date by about a month, but they're getting things together to continue music therapy services. And so they're gonna take those interns right, right along with them. So I'm, I'm really grateful to our, to our internship directors because they, they have a real commitment to music therapy and to the profession of music therapy. Um, they don't get paid extra for directing interns. They're just really committed to the fact that students need this experience. And so they've just, as they've shifted their mode of delivery, they just, they bring the interns right along with them, which is great. That's fabulous. Thanks. I have to give a shout out to our interns that were with us. They um, helped us figure out all the technology. <laughs> so we needed our interns in the switch to um, changing things. They helped us figure out how to do some of those cool videos that Dr. Ritchie showed of the senior class pulling all of that together. They helped us navigate the delay that you find in Zoom and they helped us figure out the right microphones to get and all that kind of stuff. So they took ownership. So I have to say the interns took a lot of ownership in making sure that um, they could continue to see their clients too. So it was beautiful to see the students buy in um, on wanting to finish their internship and wanting to help figure out a way that music therapy services could continue. Can one of you talk a little bit about melodic intonation therapy? And the question was asked, is this still used often? We've got so many new techniques and such, but is this still often used with stroke patients? Um, I can't speak from experience but I believe that it is still incorporated. And I think um, there's, there's a, an area of advanced practice um, called neurological music therapy, which works with stroke, stroke victims, um, people with brain injuries, um, a, a variety of, of, of conditions. And, and some of that does involve speech retraining. Um, and I think Ellen, if you know more about this, please feel free to chime in. But, but from what I know of some of those techniques, if it's not exactly the melodic intonation therapy, which, which involves, that's kind of a, a, a term that is, may not be as familiar to a lot of people, um, going from singing to speech. Um, and actually, um, so you, you, you sing phrases, but you try to sing them in a rhythm that's you know, similar to speech, and then you can transfer that to to speech patterns. And if, if people remember several years ago, the Congresswoman, Gabby Giffords, who was shot, um, music therapy was a huge part of her rehabilitation. Um, and that was part of it. It was going from singing to regaining her ability to speak. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> um, I remember when I watched the NPR um, or listened to the NPR, message about her and I listened to how that she was learning thank you and I thought about with children so me la so me how many of the things that she was doing were some of the beginning intervals that we use with children when we first start singing those things that come really naturally and it just was fascinating to me at her progress um, yeah. through that when was music therapy first developed? I remember um, a long time ago being fascinated by a, a friend of mine who wrote a song to help a young boy figure out how to spell his name. And he did that through lots of repetition. And I mean, that was a video I watched from early 70s. Um, so when was music therapy first developed? And how, when did we start realizing what a useful tool it was? Um, historically, it goes back to the early 20th century, um, veterans coming home from the First and Second World Wars. Um, you would have these big hospitals with people um, suffering from what they called shell shock. 
and and they would bring musicians in to just to play music and they noticed that it had an effect on the patients in the hospital and so out of that people began to 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 be more aware and to study to do research um i think the first music therapy education programs were the late the very late 1940s um our first professional association was founded in 1950 and that was then called um now i oh, national association for music therapy um and then there was it's it's evolved since then but but we have we have been around i would say and and it was really in the 1950s and the 1960s that we developed um journals and began really pursuing research and it's it's you know just continued today the association um is a real advocate for music for research and music therapy for um, supporting clinicians as well as educators in conducting research and and doing that so so yeah we've been around for for a while now so what are um, kind of the trending population that has seen a lot of growth over the past few years for music therapy services? Um, that's interesting. And I'll mention one and then I'm going to toss the other one over to my colleague um, because it's sort of the two ends of the life cycle. Um, one being hospice care, um, because in general, there's been real growth in, in hospice care throughout the country. And music therapy is incorporated into a lot, a lot of those settings. Some of the larger um, corporations that, that um, have hospice sites all over the country have internships in music therapy, have music therapy as, as an integral part of, of those services. And then on the opposite end, um, the, the premature babies with neonatal intensive care. And Ellen can speak to that just a bit. I think there's been a push in general for earlier intervention, right? I think a lot of research has come out that the earlier we can intervene um, with people with disabilities, that the better off their outcomes will be. Um, and so in this case, we're intervening right after birth in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and so that one has had a lot of growth in the research that's supporting it. And a lot of new neuroscience has come out, um, hard neuroscience about the effects of music at that young of an age on brain growth and on brain development. And so that has kind of pushed the desire and the demand for more music therapy in neonatal intensive care units. And um, so as I think research has really been pushing the NICU field recently um, for us to continue to grow and to be in almost every major children's hospital inside the NICU, um, which is exciting to see that growth. Um, could you talk a bit about the Pacifier activated lullaby um, therapy, and is it used both elderly and newborns or just with newborns? Or? So it is a device, it's a medical device that's actually registered as a medical device. Um, and it is was developed by Dr. Jane Stanley at Florida State University. Um, and it uses um, operant conditioning. So just a simple behavioral technique of positive reinforcement. So and it's just used with premature infants. And so premature infants have to be um, taught how to eat and, how, and learn how to eat, which would naturally happen in the womb, but doesn't always naturally happen in the NICU. And so this device, um, is a sensor that's attached to the, the infant's pacifier. And when the infant gives us a proper non-nutritive suck, that um, is one that would be needed for when working on the bottle, it rewards them with music for 10 seconds and then it goes off. And then the infant has to suck again to get the music again. So they quickly learn. Um, we are born hardwired liking music. And so the music is soothing to them. Um, it's a positive experience for them and they want more music. And so they quickly learn that their suck gets them the music and they quickly learn how to suck rhythmically um, so that they can take their bottle. Another question, um, somebody that works with individuals with special needs and disabilities um, wants to know um, what ways music therapy is used both physically and neurologically um, as rehabilitation. Um, again, I refer to the neurologic music therapy. Um, they do a lot of work with um, gait training with people who are recovering from strokes and basically having to learn how to walk again. Um, they analyze a person's basic walking pattern and then actually create music 
that is timed to support that person's unique rhythm and pace of walking. And so adding that as, as someone, you know, if you've ever seen, you know, the rehab gym and they have the pathway with the rails and you have to just spend a lot of time practicing walking, getting your feet back to, to working order again. And the music really provides um, that, that rev regular rhythmic pulse, that um, predictability. Um, it, it definitely supports people being able to, being able to walk and re regaining that, regaining those, those abilities. Um, going back to a little bit about UGA, how long has the music therapy degree been here at UGA? And can you talk a bit about the master's program that we're building? Um, music therapy was founded in 1968 at the University of Georgia. Wow. Um, the first uh, professor, Dr. Richard Graham, who was my professor, I was there a little bit after 1968, um, but he was basically, he was recruited. Basically, we had um, another faculty member, Olin Parker, who knew about music therapy. They had both studied in, in Kansas with E. Thayer Gaston, who was one of the founders of education and music therapy. And um, so Dr. Graham was recruited to come here and to start that program. And as I find this just a fascinating side note, Dr. Graham was also the first African-American faculty member at the University of Georgia. Um, so that makes me very proud. Um, and so we've been, we've been going since that time. Um, we've, we've wanted to have a master's program for a while, but it takes, you know, it takes a lot. It takes a lot more than desire. Um, it takes a certain amount of commitment from the university as well, from the administration, which I'm really happy to say that we have now. Um, and so we're really, we're sort of about halfway through developing that program. We have to get it approved by the American Music Therapy Association, as well as um, the National Association of Schools of Music. And there's a, a rigorous application process where you have to describe the courses, the goals of your, of your program, um, how you recruit students, how you, how you um, vet students for the program. And so we're, we're sort of in the middle of that process. We're hoping to have that application submitted in the fall. Um, they'll start the review the first of the year. And if all goes well, we should be able to um, accept students hopefully next fall. And then how many, about how many music therapists do we have here in the program at UGA in our undergrad program? Hmm, I want to say about 30 to 35. It's, it's kind of fluid because we have students and we have first year students who aren't actually in our courses yet. We have students who are out in internship, um, but, but I would say probably about 30 to 35 students. Um, is music therapy helpful in regaining a singing voice that, that has been neglected for years? If not, do you have recommendations? And I know you're a singer, so. Yeah, we're both singers, actually. Um, it, it can be. Um, I would say probably if somebody has vocal problems, um, they should also be working with a speech therapist um, because we're not, we may or may not be as knowledgeable about the physiological aspects. Um, but certainly just the experience of singing, of singing together in a group, um, working individually on, if, if there aren't maybe specific physiological problems, but just a lack of use, um, definitely music therapy and singing can be very beneficial. Um, you have to breathe to sing, and so even just helping with respiratory issues. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yes, I've read a lot of the music therapy research on some of the respiratory issues and using singing as a way, group singing as a way to help with that. It's very fascinating. Yeah, and there are, I'll, I'll add in one thing that, that came to mind. Um, a lot of people are, are doing choirs with Parkinson's patients and having some real success there. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's that individual experience of singing, but it's also singing in a, in a group. It can be very positive. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the drum circle? I know that that's something that we have done, seen a lot in music therapy and what kind of things um, behaviorally and emotionally are therapists trying to work with when they're using drum circles? Oh, anything from just getting people together, bringing people together. Um, it can be a very, actually a very powerful way of creating unity within a group. 
Um, you're working on listening. You have to listen to other people. Um, you're expressing yourself, but it has to be within the constraints of whatever rhythmic pattern you're dealing with. Um, there's an element of, of release, of expression. You can hit a drum really hard, and sometimes that feels really good, um, but it's a positive hitting things hard. It's, it's a way of, of venting emotions. It's, um, it's creative. Um, drum circles are, are, I've been in drum circles that were, weren't limited to drums, but where you can actually vocalize and, and add other instruments in and create something really beautiful and really musical without necessarily having to have a lot of musical training and experience. And what is the pathway to become a music therapist? Is there, um, I, there's somebody asked, is there a two-year certification? Do you have to have your master's degree, undergrad degree? What are the different pathways? Ah, that's, that's a great question because that's been up in discussion in our, in our association for, for several years now. At this point, music therapy is an undergraduate degree. That's, that's the entry level to the profession, but it's a very rigorous degree. It's not, it's not a two-year um, certificate program. It's, it's four years of, of music education. Our students are music majors, and so they have to have the experience in music theory and music history and being able to perform as well as being able to use music in a therapeutic way. And so they have four years of, of coursework. Included is that in that is um, at least 180 hours of pre-internship clinical experience. And so our students, they don't wait until they finish their coursework and then go out and, and practice. But as they're doing their coursework, and here at UGA, we start their second year in their first practicum placement so that they're actually working with clients and doing music therapy interventions, all supervised by either one of our faculty members or we have some therapists in the community who work with the students and supervise them. And so they finish the coursework and those pre-internship experiences, and then they go off and they do an internship which is usually about six months because the total from pre-internship through internship, they have to have at least 1200 hours of, of clinical training, which includes contact as well as planning and documentation and all of the elements that go into to being a therapist. And so when they've completed that internship um, and graduated, then they can take our national board certification exam. And then they are given the credential music therapist board certified. And then additionally, in a number of states, including Georgia, um, there's a state licensure, which is, it's connected to that board certification. So it's not really a separate testing process. But if you are board certified, then you're eligible to be licensed as a therapist. And then to maintain that licensure and the certification, we have to do a certain number of um, continuing education hours. Excellent. Thank you. We are just about out of time today, so I want to thank both Ellen Ritchie and Ellen Ham for coming and talk to, talking to us about music therapy. It's such a joy to have the music therapy students in uh, my classes. Music education and music therapy overlap so much with coming up with a specific thing that we're trying to accomplish and assessing that and working towards that. It's just um, always a delight to have your students. They're fabulous and such great people. So we thank both of you so much for talking to us today. One of the ways that you can support the music therapy program and the Hugh Hodgson School of Music is come to our concerts. This semester they're all live and our music therapists are, because they're music majors, they are performers as well. They're doing so many things. Um, so come and enjoy our concerts. Come look at our website and you'll see all of those options there. Um, and you can make gifts towards the program. At, as well at our website. Um, today's presentation is part of the Ask Me Anything series, and we hope you'll check out the upcoming series at alumni.uga.edu. And we appreciate all of you being with us today. I've seen a bunch of people that are former students of Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Ritchie, and they've got some shout outs here, and I'll make sure that they get those shout outs um, after we have closed out today. So we appreciate all of you being here, and we hope you stay safe and healthy, and you find some music to put through your day to help you organize your space. <laughs>